All right, here we are uh, in session two. I'm Christopher Rufo. I am the director of the Center on Wealth and Poverty, uh, continuing the legacy of George Gilder, uh, exploring a lot of those same themes uh, in my own work. Uh, for background, for those of you who are attending that don't know me, uh, I was uh, spent the first uh, 12 years of my career as a documentary filmmaker. Uh, I produced films for PBS, Netflix, National Geographic, and others. I uh, had a chance to travel all over the world exploring uh, societies and culture. The last few years, I've transitioned to do more writing and analysis and uh, uh, working here at Discovery Institute. I'm also a contributing editor at City Journal in New York. And uh, I'm going to talk a bit today about uh, kind of the flip side of what George talks about when he talks about high entropy entrepreneurship. Um, you know, I'm going to talk about really the new American poverty. And uh, I, I made a film and happy to give you guys a link to it. Uh, maybe. Uh, uh, Eric or Nate can provide a link to in the, in the comments. It's uh, americalostfilm.com slash premiere. Uh, it's a film that's going to be broadcasting nationally on PBS uh, in the fall uh, during election season. And uh, what I did, I spent uh, more than three years uh, traveling to America's uh, forgotten cities, traveling to some of the poorest uh, regions and cities in the United States, and documenting the struggles of families uh, really to survive a catastrophic economic, social, and political circumstances. And um, what I've really seen and I think is important is this. Um, for, for the vast majority of human history, poverty was a material concern. It was an economic problem. Um, you had um, the absolute kind of basics of survival and necessity uh, were out of, out of reach for many, many people throughout history. Um, in, in the Western world and now almost increasingly around the world, even in developing countries, uh, just kind of excluding some of the most entrenched uh, poor places in the world, uh, uh, material poverty has been reduced by an extraordinary amount in the last hundred years. Uh, but what we're seeing in the Western world, in the United States specifically, and then in my film, uh, these three cities, Youngstown, Ohio, Memphis, Tennessee, and Stockton, California, is that you have a new American poverty in a, in a context of material abundance. And this is really, I think, the most important uh, paradox in American life today, where you have an economic system that is putting out a tremendous capacity of goods and services. Uh, you have really a, a condition of unprecedented abundance. Uh, and yet you have uh, uh, kind of pockets of extreme poverty. Uh, you have about 50 million people in the United States uh, that live in what are called uh, distressed communities. So places that have high rates of uh, economic poverty, of educational failure, of uh, family breakdown, violence, addiction, uh, suicide. And, and, and really the question that I took is, how is this possible? Uh, how is this possible that in 2020 we have these, these places? What really characterizes them? And I think the, 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 the biggest takeaway that I can share is that uh, poverty in the United States increasingly is not an economic problem, it's a human problem. It's a cultural problem, it's a social problem. Uh, so if you look at uh, a, a city like Youngstown, Ohio, uh, or Memphis, or Stockton, um, the determinants of poverty are, aren't really lack of, uh, at this point, lack of uh, economic opportunity. Um, certainly these are economically distressed places, but uh, in all three, like Memphis, for example, there are an abundance of warehouse jobs paying $15 an hour. They can't find people fast enough. There are entry level jobs that can provide not a great wage, but in a place like Memphis where you can rent a one bedroom apartment for $300 a month, a, a living wage. Um, and, but the problems that we see now are almost, ex almost exclusively uh, uh, kind of the, 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 the predicates, the, the causes, the, the deepest kind of roots of them are, are cultural in nature. So you have what I think should be uh, in kind of the Gilder terms, a low entropy systems. These are things like family, uh, religious communities, um, uh, neighborhood organizations, things that should be kind of carriers of tradition, kind of buffers against uh, social problems, buffers against uh, dramatic changes. Uh, those have all been really, I, I, I don't think I'm overstating it, they've been destroyed. Uh, so you have neighborhoods in Memphis, for example, where 93% uh, of all families are single parent families. So the institution of family has been uh, absolutely demolished. Uh, and then you have, uh, you know, sometimes 80% of working age men 
are out of the labor force. So the institution of regular employment has been really abandoned. Uh, and then you have uh, really collapsing religious and civic institutions where uh, you have, even in the physical landscape, you see empty and boarded up churches and Elks lodges and, and mutual aid groups and local businesses, all of that landscape of local institutions that are supposed to be kind of transmitters and carriers of tradition, of culture, of stability, uh, those have been all uprooted. So you're left with really a, a very uh, profoundly difficult situation where uh, these communities have been abandoned uh, by the kind of economic change that was really the kind of core problem uh, after the war, starting in the 70s and 80s, the industrialization. But I think now more importantly is that the mechanisms that can help people adapt to economic changes. I mean, we've had economic changes in the United States throughout our whole history and people were able to adapt by moving, by reinventing, by reinvigorating, by seeking solace and support and, and kind of encouragement in family and community institutions. Now those are gone. And I, I think the consequence, we spend a lot of time in, in America talking about deindustrialization, trade policy, innovation, you know, uh, corporate monopolies, all of these kind of higher strata economic questions. Um, and, and we're still essentially having the same debate as we were in the 70s and 80s and 90s and 2000s. But I think that debate really sidesteps some key problems. I think that if you look at Innovation, I think we need more innovation. Innovation is good uh, as far as technology, as far as economic progress, as far as competition with other nations. But I think that what we've done is that we've, in, in a kind of perverse way, we've allowed uh, the real kind of hardcore, uh, kind of Gramsci-esque cultural Marxism to innovate away all of our social institutions that really held people together uh, and they've been really deliberately, I think, uh, destroyed by a concerted intellectual campaign uh, and, and then by government policy. And that's really the, the thing that I'd like to talk about next is, you know, you hear even presidential candidates, they say, you know, look at Youngstown. It's been uh, abandoned by free trade. It's been, uh, you know, the, the companies left and created a, a, a condition of, of, of economic deprivation. Um, and, and this really misses something fundamental. We're, we're essentially caught in the same intellectual and rhetorical premise that we've been grappling with for, for decades. But uh, my contention is that it doesn't really matter anymore. That ship has sailed. The steel mills in Youngstown are, are blown up and they're now empty fields. Uh, we can't really live in this perpetual cycle of debate when the real question, the most important question right now is not what happened to the steel mills, but what replaced them? And this is really the silent institutional takeover of America's poorest communities that is happening uh, really invisibly with very little discussion. Uh, but my thesis is that when the steel mills left, the bureaucracy filled the void. And I'll illustrate that through a number of, of statistical uh, kind of uh, figures that I've, I've, I've uncovered uh, and, and analyzed through census data. And, and the American Community Survey uh, in the, over the last few years. Um, the situation in Youngstown is this. If you look at total wages and total household income in Youngstown, two thirds of all household income in Youngstown is now direct federal transfer payments. So social security, uh, 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 kind of traditional cash welfare programs, food stamps, housing benefits, uh, kind of heating and other household subsidies. So if you look at the total economy, two thirds of it is direct federal transfer payments and one third of it is actual private sector wages. So this is a revolution. This is not just a change. This is actually a change of, of regime, a change of economic order. And politically, the, the problem is this. Uh, the Youngstown area has one representative uh, in the United States House of Representatives. Uh, of, of, that represents their interests. So they have you know, a, a less than one quarter of 1% of the decision-making power of what's happening in the federal government. And yet the federal programs determine two thirds of its economic activity. I mean, this is really, I think, 
uh, my, my idea that I'm developing now, be building on the, the film, which was more observational in nature, uh, my thesis is that this is really the most kind of anti-democratic, anti-republican um, kind of change of regime. This is something fundamental. Uh, Youngstown has now almost virtually no control over the dominant economic system, the dominant shaper of social life, uh, the dominant institution that really governs daily life in their city is really administered by bureaucracy, by federal rules and regulations, and by federal lawmakers that even if they were to advocate changes, Youngstown is represented at less than one quarter of 1% of the representative power. And I think this poses a, a number of questions. Uh, first of which, how do, you, how do you break out of this economic stagnation, this bureaucratic stranglehold? And then how do you really reinvigorate those cultural institutions uh, that have been uh, decimated? So if you are a community leader in the west side of Youngstown and 80% of all families are single parent families, uh, which is again, the greatest predictor of, 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 of adult poverty is growing up in a, a single parent household uh, across all racial groups. Again, these are predominantly white working class neighborhoods in Youngstown uh, where I've spent time investigating. Where do you start? How do you start to rebuild those traditions and institutions that have been really decisively broken in 50 years? Um, you know, how, 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 do you, how do you really kind of reverse the trend that I think first uh, the late uh, uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan was observing in the, in the 1960s when he observed that in uh, black households, you had a, a single parent household rate of about uh, 25%. Um, and then George explored uh, in the 70s and 80s in his series of books tackling these issues where it would be about 50%. Uh, and now this process has accelerated in poor communities where it's somewhere between 70 and 90%. Um, and, and I think even in some kind of micro communities, if you look at some Section 8 housing complexes in all three cities, again, across racial groups, um, that it's virtually 100% of families. The norm is now uh, there is really kind of no traditional conception of fatherhood that was, according to anthropologists, uh, the anthropologist Malinowski, this was a universal norm across space and time. And we are the first society to basically in, 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 in specific subsets and communities, again, across racial groups, we're the first society in human history that has abandoned this as a norm. Uh, this is catastrophic. And I don't think we have really a great sense of how we can regenerate those social institutions. And then on, and that's kind of the bottom layer of this, the social kind of substrata. And then on the top layer, we have a kind of bureaucratic system that is now um, essentially operating economic control over these communities. Two thirds of activity, you know, kind of double uh, all private sector wages, you have double uh, federal transfer payments. And, and, and even more insidiously, what, what happens is that these aren't, uh, in many cases, even direct uh, transfer payments to people's pockets, which I think would be maybe better. There's, a, there's an argument there. But you're also filtering many of this through bureaucratic institutions. So I've talked to folks uh, in, in, in these places where they say, you know, say, what is your daily or your weekly routine like? Well, on Mondays, I have to go try to get my driver's license reinstated. On Tuesday, I meet with my probation officer. On Thursday, I have my court mandated kind of psychotherapy and cognitive behavioral therapy uh, training. And then on Friday, I have to show up uh, to the child support center and then, you know, uh, and then wait all over the weekend to try to get my documents so that Monday I can show up in court. I mean, this is what I think of as a gauntlet of bureaucracy that we're forcing the poorest families in America to kind of step through. So we've interrupted their life and essentially have an invisible control system that, that in, in, in my uh, kind of qualitative interviews with thousands of people and in my quantitative analysis, looking at uh, the data, this doesn't serve anyone. This actually keeps people trapped in the rules of the game that are invented by a group of kind of naive social scientists in Washington. They're filtered through uh, the system of kind of low skill and low capability bureaucrats and administrators. And then, and then finally implemented in local communities 
by, by people who are so far uh, removed from the kind of so-called data-driven social science, uh, the actual implementation is, is, is actually hostile to people. I mean, if you spend four or five hours in a county welfare office or child support center, just kind of sitting in the waiting room and listening, uh, you get a sense that this is actually um, almost a, a, a kind of, it's kind of devolved into a bureaucratic kind of, kind of, uh, uh, kind of Kafka-esque um, war against local institutions and local people. Uh, it doesn't show respect. It actually, uh, it actually really makes, it conducts tremendous harm. So that is the, in my view, uh, one of the critical questions. And I think that if you look at uh, George's work, um, comparing poverty and comparing the kind of heights of entrepreneurship, we're in this really bizarre stratified world where um, we have uh, economic innovation at the top, tremendous technical capacity uh, at, at the top, but it, it really has been disconnected from the social and community and reality of families in poor communities. And I think that to me is the spread that is really fascinating. So uh, I, I'd like to jump into some questions. Uh, I can field them myself, I'm gonna turn up the brightness here. Um, uh, I'm so sorry, I'm gonna butcher your Polish name. Uh, Macy, Masij, uh, I'm so sorry. It says, hello, Mr. Rufo, great job on Fox last night. Uh, appreciate that. I did Tucker Carlson, always fun. Um, uh, uh, the question is, uh, based on the official policies put, put forth by Black Lives Matter, do you believe that social declines in Youngstown, Memphis, and Stockton will spread even further uh, around even larger cities across the nation? Um, yeah, absolutely. And I think that if you look at uh, Black Lives Matter, um, I mean, first on the face of it, I think that there's almost 100% universal agreement uh, that, that Black Lives Matter. And I, I think that that is really kind of a, a, a an, an undebatable phrase because it's 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 really universally accepted. But if you look at the kind of if you take take off from the banner, the slogan at the top, and you actually look at the movement uh, uh, underneath Black Lives Matter, and and really you don't have to take my word for it. You can go and actually read the source documents, read their political platform. You can read their demands. You can read. Uh, uh, their their interviews and speeches and 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 uh, and, and other materials. Um, this is an explicitly kind of uh, kind of again kind of Gramsci esque cultural Marxist project. And um, really, I think that it's their their views are are kind of a a, a continuation of about a hundred years of of social theory, uh, where you had kind of early Marxist theorists that are going after all of those impediments to government control, impediments to radical social change. So it, it, first, it's, an, it's an, an explicitly kind of atheist uh, movement that is hostile to traditional religion. And if you look at um, kind of all the Marxist literature, they always viewed the church as kind of a traditional obstacle to radical change. And this, it, it must be kind of explicitly laid out that this is in almost 100% contradiction to the civil rights movement in the 1960s. You have to remember that the civil rights movement in the 1960s emerged out of African-American churches. It emerged out of black religious communities. Uh, you know, these are preachers. And if you look at the speeches of Martin Luther King, it's, it's really fascinating uh, for this reason. I, I've recently read back some of his speeches. He combined in a synthesis the kind of black Christian a worldview and morality with, you know, um, in, in great detail and actually scholarly rigor, the founding ideals uh, of Jefferson and then, the, and then the ideals that they were kind of completed uh, in a kind of way station with Lincoln. And then he really viewed himself as a transmitter of the founding ideas that were then taken up by Lincoln and now reached a kind of height uh, in, in, at that time in the civil rights movement. So, Martin Luther King combined the, the, the idealism of the founding with the kind of spiritual uh, kind of uh, uh, authority of the black Christian churches and united them in this kind of uh, activism uh, that, that was uh, kind of taking up the mantle. There's none of that in the Black Lives Matter movement. It's explicitly atheist. Uh, it is hostile to religion, hostile to faith groups. Um, and it certainly doesn't seek to 
uh, kind of elevate the, the spirit of the founding. It's actually seeking to destroy the founding uh, and, and, and perpetuate the narrative uh, that the, the founding was actually kind of a, the idealism was a cover story for, uh, for kind of naked evil and racism. And actually we need to destroy the founding, uh, destroy the kind of uh, contemporary order and usher in this kind of new uh, kind of utopia now in American cities. But, you know, I think the, the question is really, per, is really getting at, 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 at this, um, What's going to happen? I mean, I've seen firsthand in Seattle in a very rapid uh, succession. Um, you're going to actually uh, create the very thing you think you're fighting against. And if you look at the experience in Seattle of the CHAS, the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone, um, what happens when you destroy the civic order, when you kind of um, block out any of those traditional institutions and you bring in kind of uh, these uh, kind of hilarious uh, kind of anarchists and socialists and sloganeers, uh, when they attempt to kind of replace tradition with their with their kind of new kind of social sociological order and radical political order, uh, you get chaos. Uh, and it's no question that um, at the end of Chaz's kind of three week experiment, uh, you have a uh, you had you know black men killed, uh, you had six black men shot, you had a murder rate that was fifty times higher than the murder rate of Chicago. Obviously, that's a limited sample size, but I think it speaks to the idea that um, when you put these ideas into practice, just symbolically, right? I mean, Chaz is not a government or a state or, 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 or uh, a, a really kind of rigorous analytical comparison point, but from a kind of symbolic point of view, I think it speaks to this larger uh, question that what happens when you put these ideas in order uh, in, in the Chaz kind of, uh, you know, the death of young black men accelerated rapidly. And then when you put these ideas in order, if you look at the 20th century, when you put them in order at a bigger scale, uh, you look at kind of uh, what happened in the Soviet Union or China uh, or even, you know, kind of parts of Europe, uh, it doesn't lead to the outcomes that you intend. And then when you emerge from the kind of nightmare of uh, kind of radical theory driven society, that tries to wipe out all of those old institutions. Um, when you emerge from that, you find tremendous difficulty at re reinvigorating those institutions. You know, I spent a, a long time in the nation of Mongolia, right? A, a place not many people go, but uh, they were, you know, one of the first Soviet satellite countries. The Soviets came in, they burned down all of the Buddhist temples, they destroyed all of the relics, they outlawed any kind of prayer or religious activity, and they really uh, destroyed the traditional Mongolian way of life. And then as they emerged from communism, uh, they were bewildered. They had no kind of center point. They had no structure they could go on. And they were, you know, some remarkable things though, and the optimistic side. Uh, I, I met a, a Mongolian, uh, a, a Buddhist monk who had, um, his grandfather had, as the, as the Soviets were sweeping in and destroying everything, he had buried barrels of, of religious texts and relics uh, deep into the ground. And they stayed there for 75 years. And when the Soviets left, they finally dug out these barrels full of their old religious texts and they brought them uh, to the surface. They uncovered them and they say, you know, we've passed these down secretly. This is where we start over. Um, and we're seeing now some kind of resurgence of their religious life and traditional life. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a brutal thing. So. I think that you're going to see a rapid scattering of and, and kind of um, as the radicals take over the, the kind of reins of local government, as they take over the institutions of power, uh, you're going to see uh, the most capable people, the most capable businesses, the most dynamic uh, uh, parts of society, they're going to kind of quickly uh, kind of reassess and over time perhaps move operations uh, outside the city limits. And then you're going to be left with people who are either the kind of radical intelligentsia that are operating the machinery or the people that are really dependent on and kind of subsumed underneath the machinery. And you're going to see a cycle of, of really failure, uh, chaos, and violence. Uh, take the next question. Uh, Jun Sung asks, are you saying bureaucratization is intrinsically atheistic and socialist? If so, how do we resist centralization, especially since centralization seems to abide uh, by the Matthew principle? 
he uh, he who has uh, he, uh, he who has will be given more. He who has not, even what he has will be taken away. I think bureaucratization um, in the context of American society uh, and, and really kind of the West is intrinsically atheistic and socialist. I mean, you can make the other argument that some bureaucracies are, are, are kind of theocratic in nature, right? The Vatican is, um, uh, don't quote me on this, but I, I imagine the Vatican is probably the biggest uh, bureaucracy in the world. Uh, certainly covers the most territory, um, but but the bureaucracy in the West is explicitly uh, kind of uh, atheist in nature, uh, kind of secular in nature rather. Uh, well, historically secular in nature, but I think now has become atheistic in nature. Uh, but now actually uh, my latest investigations into um, so-called diversity training in the federal government has shown that it's not secular. So you look at the kind of uh, Max, uh, the, the kind of Weberian bureaucracy of a secular bureaucracy that that stood kind of to the side and equal parts to the religious uh, authorities and then the kind of the, the secular state. Um, you then transfer that to a, a bureaucracy that is uh, really atheistic in nature, uh, hostile and more influential than any kind of uh, parallel cultural and faith institutions. You've actually moved into a third phase really in the last five years uh, where you have a, a bureaucracy that is a, a, a kind of a militant bureaucracy that is becoming radicalized with a political agenda, where they now have, uh, through leaked documents that I've shared uh, widely throughout the media, um, you know, they're really kind of training bureaucracies into critical race theory, uh, into kind of a radical, soft uh, Marxist program, uh, ostensibly under the kind of guidance of, of social science, but really using that as kind of a battering ram to inject hyper -political, politicalization into the bureaucracy, uh, and really along the lines of kind of classical uh, kind of um, group identity, uh, uh, kind of um, uh, Marxism as it really was formulated uh, by the theoretician Herbert Mar Marcuse. Uh, they're, they're now explicitly training bureaucrats at almost all levels of government uh, to essentially be uh, uh, good Marxists. And it's astonishing because you have uh, the bureaucracy is now no longer a kind of uh, kind of the FDR. The bureaucracy was really fighting for the common man, dispensing um, kind of basic services, uh, modernizing through infrastructure. Uh, I know some of my colleagues have problems with FDR, but 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 you can really get a sense of what FDR was doing with the federal bureaucracy at that time was was building America and creating kind of relief programs. That, that were needed, uh, that were perceived to be needed at the time. And whichever way you stand on, on that, there's a theoretical debate that continues. Uh, that is a, a kind of a, a, a multiple order regime different than what's happening now, which is a bureaucracy that it seeks to extend itself and replace cultural institutions uh, that are naturally occurring uh, with uh, cultural institutions that are designed on the kind of uh, kind of uh, cultural Marxist theory. Uh, and I, I don't think that you can resist. And I, I think that I, I've seen very few uh, kind of theoretical ideas to attack. Uh, I don't think a, 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 you, you know, you, the starve the beast um, uh, kind of theory uh, didn't work. That's very hard. Um, my, my sense is that in very kind of brief terms, uh, this is going to be something I'm fleshing out later uh, over the next few years. But my sense is that you actually have to deconstruct the bureaucracy um, and then try to decentralize the bureaucracy. And I think, you know, again, following uh, the George uh, Gilder kind of theories, I think that uh, decentralized governance through blockchain can be a tremendous asset here. Uh, I think trying to figure out how you can blow up the bureaucracy and then uh, push it back down on the principle of subsidiarity to the kind of most ground level uh, is possible. Uh, I, I don't know that the conservative campaign to kind of, uh, kind of reverse the bureaucracy and, and, and destroy the bureaucracy and cut taxes, uh, I, I don't know that's tenable. I think you have to deconstruct and then reconstruct it along the lines of decentralization. And one of the most amazing things is that, um, an anecdote that I love to share with you, but th these federal agencies are running on cobalt code, 
kind of IBM Cobalt code that precedes the DOS operating system. I mean, our federal bureaucracies are administering the programs on, 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 on a computer code that was obsolete in like 1965. I mean, this is a, a symbol of how obsolete our bureaucracy is. I think you really need to go, and this is, I think, the kind of new kind of conservative revolutionary spirit that needs to say we have changed regimes with our bureaucracy. We need to smash it. We need to deconstruct it. We need to go from kind of cobalt code to kind of the, the, the future of, of blockchain and Ethereum and, and really kind of high uh, decentralization and high um, kind of uh, uh, responsibility and kind of high security code. And we need to use the kind of genius of the new kind of Silicon Valley imagination to take over the bureaucracy, deconstruct it, and then re-administer it in a way that is actually good for people, that gets it out of the hands of, frankly, useless and malevolent bureaucrats, and puts, restores the power and money uh, and, 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 and authority and responsibility uh, back to the American people. Because again, the situation where Youngstown, Ohio, their entire society is predicated on a governing system and an econ economic system uh, for which they have almost no representation uh, is anti-American at its core and I think should be, uh, should be destroyed. So are, are we, um, we have some time, take some more questions. Um, YFZ asks, does this bureaucracy belong to the swamp or deep state as defined by Trump? Um, you know, I, I think there's kind of a range, right, where uh, uh, the swamp is a good, a, a good, a good description. Uh, I know I'm working on a paper right now with Heritage Foundation, where I'm analyzing uh, uh, federal uh, housing and urban development. So the Department of Housing and Urban Development (HUD). I'm looking at their uh, homelessness housing block grants. It's a multi-billion-dollar program. Uh, I've done a full analysis on what's wrong with it. Um, and then some recommendations on what to do with it. And you know, my sources within HUD um, have told me that the kind of legend of the swamp is absolutely real, where you have the political appointees from the president that they're going in there with a specific agenda and how to reform them within their kind of statutory power, within their power to, to overhaul regulations. You know, this is really at the discretion of the political appointees, but the career HUD bureaucrats that have all of the levers of the system at their disposal. They know all of the kind of minutia of the bureaucratic process. They have really stymied the political appointees. They've uh, been hostile to their ideas. They've put up roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. And the attitude among the kind of permanent bureaucracy is this. Your president is going to be here for four years or maybe eight years. I'm going to be here for 30 years. And I will outlast you no matter how long you're here. We're going to get a different administration. Uh, and really, uh, you have the kind of uh, figurehead uh, political appointees. Um, but we have the kind of inertia and the, the kind, of, uh, kind, of, uh, kind, of, kind of paper, uh, uh, kind of paper authority where we can um, la outlast you um, and we can kind of outfox you because you're not a lifetime bureaucrat. And I think this is absolutely a, a, a swamp. I mean, the people who go into Washington, go into the bureaucracy as political appointees, they wanna make changes, they get mired in the swamp. The deep state is another thing. I think there is a conspiracy theory oriented deep state or, or kind of a real kind of out there, uh, a, a kind of caricature of the deep state, but, um, that I, that I think is false. I don't think that there is a, cons I, I think it's not a conspiracy. Uh, it's incompetence and it's hostility. Uh, you don't need actually a conspiracy. You can actually do much more damage uh, just through bureaucratic incompetence. But, but I, I, I think that the, the deep state is not so much a, a, a conspiracy as it is a, a reality when you have a large bureaucracy, um, that, that you have a kind of deeply entrenched state apparatus that doesn't change, not necessarily because it's being controlled behind the scenes. I, I don't think that's true. I don't think there's strong evidence, but that it's because it's, it's become entrenched and kind of, kind of ossified in this world. And now it's being really kind of controlled at the kind of senior manager level by people who are, have an ideological agenda of critical race theory, 
um, uh, and, and, and the kind of associated kind of neo-Marxist agenda, a neo-Marxist uh, kind of worldview, that now they're kind of weaponizing the bureaucracy into a kind of permanent institution uh, that they've kind of really started to take from a kind of secular and social science-based, in theory, social science-based bureaucracy to now an ideology-based bureaucracy and a weaponized bureaucracy that is now a source of political radicalization, uh, regardless of what administration is in play. Um, and, you know, the, the, the person that I think is, uh, I'd like to beat up on and I think deserves being beat up on is a man named Howard Ross. Uh, I exposed video and audio transcripts of a, of a uh, training that he did uh, where he was encouraging federal employees to essentially undo their whiteness. Uh, he perpetuated the narrative that America is a land of a kind of irredeemable racism and evil and that it was encouraging federal employees to join a radical kind of almost communist party style uh, activism. Uh, his co-host was actually a former fellow traveler of the Communist Party USA. Uh, involved in, in, in perpetuating kind of the, the worst regimes uh, in, in the 60s and 70s in Cuba and Angola and elsewhere, and then was an editor of a communist journal. And, and these were people who are hired and paid by the bureaucracy under the Trump administration that are actively hostile to the administration, actively perpetuating ideas that are antithetical to uh, the kind of campaign themes uh, of the president. And this individual, Howard Ross, has been doing these kind of diversity and critical race theory trainings in the federal government. Um, and over the last 15 years, he's billed the federal government $3 million to conduct these trainings. So you have a kind of permanent apparatus that continues to operate and profit off of these uh, kind of radicalization schemes, whether, whether it's Obama or Trump or Bush or the next guy, uh, these people never go away. And you know, he, gave, he was awarded a $500,000 grant to conduct sexual orientation workshops. Uh, the, the title is actually amazing. Power and Privilege Sexual Orientation Workshops for NASA. So I, I, I don't know how kind of, uh, kind of uh, alternative kind of sexuality workshops and kind of maybe some kind of bondage theme, uh, kind of uh, power, uh, power sexuality, uh, I'm still waiting on a records request to find the details, but I'm not sure how spending a half million dollars on power and privilege sexual orientation workshops helps us get to Mars first. I don't think that if you went to the amazing, incredible engineers that were literally by hand banging in all of the rivets to those first spacecrafts that went to the moon without really sophisticated computer systems, if you ask those men, you know, when you were you know, getting ready, when you were checking your systems uh, to send Neil Armstrong to the moon, you know, do you think that you were, your, your mission was jeopardized by not having a power and privilege sexual, sexual orientation workshop? Um, they would look you like you were completely insane and they would quietly escort you out, the wor out, out of the room and get back to work. So this is a major concern and I, I've been, done my small part to try to publicize this, but I think it's a battle that we have to fight on principle and we have to be courageous because if you oppose these things, they're going to call you all sorts of, uh, of evolving epithets. You have to ignore these folks and fight on principle. This is a battle that can be won, but it can only be won if the majority of people uh, rise up and fight against it. Another question. Going back to the discussion of America's struggling cities, um, how does the retraction of innovation investment in the nation's poor cities affect the development of cultural poverty? Um, is it cultural poverty that drives the innovation away uh, or, or, or is it, you know, vice versa? I, I think that kind of the historical experience in these three cities in Youngstown, Memphis, and Stockton, I, I think that you have in, in those cases at that time, starting in kind of the 70s, 80s, accelerating the 90s, I think it was first economic collapse, right? You have first the kind of, uh, uh, the kind of um, through, I mean, very clearly some very complicated combination of a kind of uh, um, a lack of innovation on behalf of the old industries. I mean, these are people that were running steel mills pretty much in the same way that they had been running them since the 1930s. Um, 
to trade policy that made uh, kind of American steel uh, 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 um, less competitive on the world market to then kind of corruption. A place like Youngstown was very corrupt. Uh, you had kind of, kind of trade unionist corruption and, 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 and a kind of political structure that was parasitic on industry uh, that, that, that had bribes and corruption and mafia running the show. That industry tanked and then as a result, kind of on parallel tracks, you had the kind of cultural breakdown and then the kind of disastrous cultural and social policies of the federal government starting in the late 1960s, those two things running parallel led to this kind of problem. But the question at this point is, how do you revive them? You have a, a kind of economically decimated community that's run on um, uh, essentially federal transfers. And then you have a, a workforce that has tremendous problems. Uh, you have high rates of educational failure. You have high rates of family dysfunction, high rates of alcohol and drug abuse, overdose deaths. Um, I mean, certainly Google is not going to open an engineering office in Youngstown. So you have really a tremendously bifurcated economy where Google is thinking not, should I open an office in Youngstown? They're thinking, should I open an office in Singapore? Uh, and, and should I should should I open an office in New York or Seattle or or Redmond, you know, where Microsoft's campus is based? Um, so you have a kind of clustering of extreme innovation, and then uh, really on the bottom end you have uh, a clustering of social dysfunction. And I think that you know the the the, the theory for a while, uh, the kind of conservative free market solution was uh, enterprise zones and. You know, I, I probably disagree with some of my colleagues, but I, I think in practice, enterprise, enterprise zones uh, are, are don't, don't work. They actually end up becoming a, a form of kind of corporatism and corruption in their own right, where you have a kind of developer can come in and put in a Holiday Inn Express uh, on the outside edge of, of Memphis uh, and, and bring in employees and bring in people uh, with these massive tax breaks, but it doesn't do anything to actually address the problems in Memphis. It's not that the 38126 zip code on the south side of Memphis, where you have 92% rate of single families, 80% uh, of, of men are out of the labor force. You have a, a, the highest rate of violence uh, in almost anywhere in the world. It's not like what they really needed was a tax break for a Holiday Inn Express. What those folks need is, a, is a, to be put on a level political and social and cultural playing field. It's actually the height of condescension from policymakers that they think they can slice up the United States by social science formula in some office in DC, and they can kind of plop in Holiday Inn Expresses and, and warehouse facility centers kind of by math, like kind of rudimentary Excel magic, that that's gonna revive these communities. No, what these communities need is they needed to be treated with respect because right now they're treated with condescension they need to be fully enfranchised, not just by voting, but enfranchised politically. They need to have a true political voice and representation. They need to be elevated and, but to a, a, a equal participation economically by getting rid of all those public policies and transfer programs that serve the kind of perverse function of keeping them entrenched in these communities. They need a a, a political class with the political and moral courage to restore the moral foundation uh, in these, to allow the uh, residents themselves to restore the moral foundation. Because, you know, the, the, the only functioning institutions, for example, in this neighborhood in south side of Memphis, are the black churches that are the backbone of these places, that are the cornerstone of these communities, that are the only remaining institution that survived the onslaught of destruction. And if you go into these places on Sunday, um, these are people, and listen to them, they have the answer for their communities. They need to be enfranchised and empowered to have that bottom-up approach that restores the moral foundation, that fights against any kind of policy that destroys communities, and that they can lift people up and, and, and really restore that kind of ground-up entrepreneurship. It's not going to be a Google engineering office that saves the south side of Memphis. It's going to be small businesses, small entrepreneurs, small service sector jobs. It's going to be kind of um, 
creative micro entrepreneurs that, that if you talk to people that are very talented, they say, you know, I have a, a front door catering business. I have a front door hair braiding business. I have a front door business where I take my car and I take the old folks in the neighborhood to their hospital appointments for 10 bucks. You need to take that kind of entrepreneurship, that, that bootstrap entrepreneurship that the great economist Thomas Sal has observed throughout history. These small bootstrap entrepreneurs have created, you know, not necessarily the next great wealth, but they've created a kind of dignified, self-sufficient life. And then they can bring people up through that system and get people kind of perpetuated throughout the economy in a successful way. Uh, much in the way that, a, a, you know, a, 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 a Walter Williams, the great conservative black economist, or, or Ben Carson, uh, you talk about his childhood, what really hit, got, brought him uh, up through the ranks and is still happening to this day. So I, I think that you have to, um, kind of abandon the illusion of policy-driven restoration. Uh, I, I think policy-driven solutions have, in many cases, created complications that uh, deepen the problem. And you need to find a way where you can actually restore a sense of freedom to these places, empower the actual people who have a vested interest in these communities. So those church groups, those faith groups, those small businesses, those citizens, um, you have to then treat them with respect uh, and then treat them with a sense of not only the rhetoric of equality, but true equality. Uh, and, and I think that's really the, the conservative fight that's needed is to, um, to, to restore full uh, social equality, full political equality, uh, and, and, and then point out that um, right now, uh, those things must be restored from within. And our job uh, is to, as, as kind of policy uh, minds, as thinkers, is to figure out uh, how to really bust barriers and break up institutions that, that keep places like Memphis and Youngstown and Stockton, again, across all racial groups, uh, 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 a common problem that keep people um, kind of trapped in, in a kind of permanent bureaucracy. I think, uh, I think that's probably the last question. Um, if my sense of the schedule is right, uh, maybe Nate or Eric, you can confirm. Uh, this session is ending right about now. <laughs>